Welcome everyone and thank you for calling in to our first webinar as part of Fleet Management Awareness Month this January. We're glad that you were able to join us today. You should notice on your screen that there is a poll question. We'd like to gauge the audience's level of experience before we get started and also while I go over just a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, we are recording this session and we'll be posting this on the NPMA Asset Management YouTube channel, so you can look out for that later. Um, but keeping that in mind, I want to go through the process for how you can ask questions in the presentation, just keeping in mind that those questions will be posted on YouTube, so just be aware, please. Um, the questions, if you have any, may be asked at any point in the presentation. Our presenter, Willie, um, has offered to, uh, to take them at any point. If you would like to ask a question out loud, you'll notice in the control panel that you have through the GoToWebinar tool that there is a hand icon next to your name. If you press that hand icon, you're basically letting me know that you have a question and I will unmute you at an appropriate time and let you ask that question out loud. It is a sensitive little icon, so just be, uh, be aware that you might accidentally press your hand, so just keep an eye on that as well. Um, if you prefer to ask a question anonymously, you're welcome to type your question in, and then I will ask it on your behalf without stating your name. Um, so you can ask questions either of those two ways, whatever you prefer. Um, two of our attendees today will receive an Amazon gift card, so I will notify you later this afternoon if you're one of our random prize drawing winners. Um, if you are attending with a group, for example, in a conference room at your company and not everyone is logged into the webinar, um, that is not a problem. You can either send me an email or you can type in the chat box or a question um, just to send over the list of names of people that are attending with you so I can make sure their attendance is recorded. And those of you that are NPMA members will get one CEU credit for participating as well. I am going to close out the poll so we can take a look at the results before we get into the presentation. Looks like most of you have voted. And let's take a look at the results real quick. So we've got a, a great group here. So 37% of you are brand new to fleet management. We have 39% with experience, 6% of experts. Please send me a note. I'll be happy to get you a presentation next year. That's awesome. And then we have 19% of you that are here to learn more about fleet management, you're not necessarily involved at this time. So that is fantastic. I'm going to hide the poll and everyone at this time should see the Fleet Speak presentation slides on your screen. And I am going to turn our presentation over to our presenter, William Gukin. Uh, Willie is from Mercury Associates and they are one of NPMA's fantastic partners and they really help us a lot with our certification program for federal fleet and also our fleet education. So we're really thankful for them for their support and appreciate Willie taking the time to share this presentation with us today. So with that, Willie, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Jessica. And as Jessica said, my name is William Gook and I'm with Mercury Associates. And what I'm gonna be doing today is I'm gonna introduce you to a variety of acronyms, terms, regulatory requirements that every person working in the fleet arena should have a comprehensive knowledge of. And uh, before we go to the next slide, I want to let you know there are a lot of acronyms. These are not all inclusive, uh, but uh, they will uh, open your eyes, I think, to some things you need to know. Slide is not changing, Jessica. There we go. Okay, uh, individuals working in the fleet arena, whether you are federal, state, local government, or corporation, you have to have an understanding of these various acronyms and terms that are commonly used within fleet management. A uh, big one uh, within the federal community that started up a little over a year ago is the asset level or vehicle level data. Uh, for many years, fleet managers outside of the federal government have been collecting this, uh, but this collection of this data is new uh, requirement within the federal space uh, beginning physical year 2017 and uh, was first reported in Federal Automotive Statistical Tool this past October the December timeframe. And I know that many federal departments and agencies struggled with this 
Uh, it's my understanding that the folks at the uh, GSA OGP or Office of Government Wide Policy Shop, they know it's going to be a rough road. They don't expect perfection the first year, uh, but time to grow on that. But again, this is something that's been going on for a long time in the corporate uh, state and local governments. Uh, of course, alternative fuels or AF, that's very uh, common. Alternative fuel vehicles, um, APWA or American Public Works Association. Uh, for those of you out in the corporate world, uh, state local government, uh, that's an excellent organization to join, uh, and they do provide training that is uh, uh, pointed towards or focused upon uh, folks who are doing work in the public works sector. B20, or biodiesel, 20%, uh, 80% petrol diesel. Uh, again, that's just uh, something that's common throughout the uh, country, and some states are actually using B100. Uh, but what I want to do here on the next three is uh, we're going to jump around uh, with these next three acronyms and discuss them in the order that you can obtain the certifications. CFFS is a Certified Fleet Specialist or Federal Fleet Specialist. And what that is, that's defined as someone who works to support fleet activities, often part-time, such as a vehicle control officer or a fleet point of contact in an office that is often involved in day-to-day -day field operations. Uh, the next level of certification is the Certified Federal Fleet Administrator, or CFFA. And what that is, that's defined as someone who manages a small or mid-sized fleet program at a headquarters or region or bounded installation uh, or campus location. And a good example of that would be, say, uh, at NASA at the Greenbelt facility there in Maryland. That would be considered a campus type environment. Uh, another uh, idea on something like that, but a much larger scale, would be Camp Pendleton. Uh, that is an enclosed, that is a uh, installation level uh, campus or, uh, or Marine Corps base. And of course, the final level of certification is Certified Federal Fleet Manager. And that's defined as someone who manages a mid sized or large fleet program and has policy, planning, reporting and acquisition oversight responsibilities among other leadership roles. And what I would tell folks, uh, especially within the fleet community and the federal space, uh, these certifications are becoming very highly recognized and uh, it will give you an opportunity not only to learn what it is you should be doing as a federal fleet manager, but also hopefully open some doors for future advancement. Uh, compressed natural gas or CNG, I think that's pretty clear. Cost per hour. <clears throat> a lot of folks will say, well, why do I need to know my cost per hour? Well, when you're running a fleet, you need to know, uh, especially if you're in the trucking or the buses or something like that, you need to know how much is it costing you per hour to run that fleet. That is a metric that you can measure your performance against. Same thing with cost or cents per mile. Uh, ethanol, which is 85% ethanol and 15% gasoline. Of course, we all know that's only used in a flex fuel vehicle. Uh, executive orders, these are something that pertains primarily to the federal space, and those are issued by the Office of the President. Uh, Energy Policy Act, uh, that's one that covers everybody from corporate to federal to state and local government. And when these come out, uh, they're uh, oftentimes written into law or United States Code and everybody has to uh, play different parts of it. Uh, of course, fleet attainment plan, that is something that's, uh, again, somewhat new within federal space the last few years. Uh, this is something that's also been used to state, local governments, and corporations, where you actually determine what your fleet should look like and what the configurations of it should be. And FAST, uh, that is primarily within the federal space, and that's federal automotive statistical tool. Uh, and that is uh, ran by the Idaho National Labs uh, and, uh, of course, Michelle Kirby. And the folks out there are the ones that you would contact for that. Uh, FedFMS, that's GSA's Federal Fleet Management System. And, uh, folks, if you don't have an FMIS or, or Fleet Management Information System, this is one that's made available by GSA. Uh, and it's primarily for those who have owned vehicle fleets. Is it a all-encompassing FMIS? No, uh, but it is far better than having nothing. There's a lot of applicability and items in there that will help you manage your fleet. Uh, and then, of course, FEMP for the Federal Energy Management Program. That's a DOE program. 
If you're not familiar with that, I suggest that you Google it and you'll see there's lots of tools that's made available in that program to help you on a day-to-day -day management. As mentioned a second ago with the E85, the Flex Fuel Vehicle, or FFV, and then you have uh, Fleet Dash, uh, which is a fleet sustainability dashboard. Again, that is run by FEMP or FEMP. And what I was tell you on that is that's an opportunity for you to go in, take a look at where your vehicles are fueled and where they possibly had had missed opportunities for obtaining alternative fuels. Oftentimes, uh, drivers will fuel up at one station when directly across the street. They could have gotten an alternative fuel, it'd be a B20 or E85. And of course, I talked a little bit already about fleet management information system, uh, FMPs or fleet management plan. <clears throat> Within the federal space, this is uh, pretty much like a strategic plan that you're writing. This is the opportunity for you to tell your story about your fleet. Uh, it's uh, the only time that you're going to be able to put something down in writing that will go all the way up to Congress, the Office of Management and Budget, where they know why it is you have the types of vehicles you have and what your operational conditions and why you have to have the fleet size that you presently have. And a couple of years ago, uh, they actually started adding these into the Strategic Sustainability Performance Plans, which are published in June. And one thing you have to be aware of, that is open to the general public. So whatever you put in that plan, general public will be reading. And so you need to make sure that you're upfront and open with everything. Uh, of course, the uh, Federal management regulations, I think they pretty well speak for themselves. Uh, federal Motor Vehicle Registration System. Uh, for those of you in the federal space, uh, you should be very knowledgeable of this. This is a uh, GSA and Unicor <coughs> partnership, and this is where your license plates are obtained from and then turned back into for disposal. And again, you can go onto the GSA OGP website and you can get all the information you want on FMVRS. Gasoline gallon equivalent, or GGE, uh, that's a means of measuring uh, energy output for different types of fuels. Uh, with the GGE, uh, what they do is they take a look at it and what one gasoline gallon equivalent is, you compare that to diesel, and you'll see that the, there's a higher burn rate or BTU rate for diesel than there is for GGE, but it's a standard or a measurement. And of course, GHG, or greenhouse gas, that is a big one within the federal uh, government because now uh, what they're doing is they're measuring how much CO2 that you're emitting, and uh, so you have to report this annually. And of course, global positioning systems, GPS is common, uh, gross, gross vehicle weight ratings, or GVWR. Uh, that is something you'll find on the B post, and the B post is the post when you open the door of the vehicle, you look down and it'll tell you what your GVWR is for a vehicle. And what that is, it's a maximum operating weight of a vehicle as specified by the manufacturer, be it Ford, GM, whoever. Uh, this includes a chassis, body, engine, fuel, uh, fluids, accessories, the driver, the passengers, and the cargo. So in other words, uh, when you look at the GVWR, that's everything with the vehicle. And if you should load it up, that would be the maximum weight that it could carry. One of the big ones here is a lot of folks, they upfit or modify vehicles, uh, say to carry more weight, uh, pull heavier trailers and things like that. And so it may change that GVWR. And you have to make sure that you have a shop that is certified to change that. Uh, home to work transportation are also known as domicile to duty. Uh, that's been a real big one within the federal space. And I know the same thing within state, local governments and corporations. Uh, where you have uh, especially law enforcement types who use these vehicles, go back and forth uh, to work, uh, gives them a better response time. And of course, the interagency fleet management system, uh, that's actually covered by the Code of Federal Regulations. And what that is, that's GSA fleet. And so when you look at interagency fleet management system and people talk about it, it's actually GSA fleet, which is part of the Federal Acquisition Service. And they are the ones that have GSA fleet lease. They also have GSA's Fed, FMS, and things like that. And so if you're leasing or procuring vehicles through the General Services Administration, that is who you're purchasing them from. 
And of course, KPIs, key performance uh, indicators, uh, life cycle cost analysis, um, light duty vehicles, and then there's of course law enforcement, and there's categories one, two, and three. And where you find the definition for those, and we'll get into it a little bit later, is in FMR, Federal Management Regulation B33. And then of course, low greenhouse gas or low greenhouse gas emitting vehicles. Next slide here, of course, you got uh, LPG or liquid propane gas, uh, LACVs or low speed electric vehicles. Folks, uh, these vehicles oftentimes are now replacing sedans, compact sedans, whatever it may be, uh, on campuses or installations uh, that are smaller in nature. They are limited to speed. However, if you have those and if you're in the federal space, you have to report these in your federal automotive fiscal tool or FAST. And so if you are not reporting them, you need to report them. They do count as another uh, vehicle. Maintenance and repair, so that's explanatory. Of course, MPG miles per gallon. Uh, why is that important? Because obviously, the more miles per gallon a vehicle gets, the better uh, the cost savings is going to be uh, for your budget and also the less emissions it's going to be putting out in greenhouse gas. Metropolitan statistical area, also known as a combined metropolitan statistical area. And this one here is easily uh, described as Los Angeles would be considered a metropolitan statistical area. But if you put all the communities in that encompass around Los Angeles, those are also included, and that's called a combined metropolitan statistical area. First, motor vehicle operator, MVO, motor vehicle record, or MVR, model year. Uh, NAFA, the National Association of Fleet Administrators, um, is an excellent organization. They do provide certification training at uh, different uh, levels. And if you're in the uh, corporate world, that might be one you want to look at. National Archives and Records Administration, this is where folks within the federal space or the contractor area supporting the fed space, you go to get a determination on how long you have to maintain your records. Sometimes they may say one year, sometimes they may say you have to keep the record uh, from cradle to death of the, uh, the asset. Uh, natural gas vehicle, NGV. Uh, MPMA, of course, you are on a webinar that's sponsored by the MPMA. And what they do, they provide training and professional certifications in the fields of property management and federal fleet management. And so uh, when we talk about property management, we talk about strictly limited to personal property. So infrastructure, buildings, and things like that are not part of that. Uh, this is uh, more in the personal property realm, which, of course, fleet vehicles also fall under. Uh, natural units are in you, uh, onboard diagnostics. Uh, a lot of folks, especially now with the telematics requirements, uh, you hear that term onboard diagnostics continually because that's another method within the vehicle where they're capturing data on how the vehicle's being operated. Uh, OEM, the original equipment manufacturer such as Ford, and of course uh, OFM is the Office of Fleet Management and that is uh, GSA and then the optimal fleet profile, uh, that is something that is within the FAST or Federal Automotive Statistical Tool, and that's where you show what your current fleet may look like and what your to be or what you project it to be in the future years. Okay, some more fleet acronyms here for you. Uh, OMB, uh, of course, Office of Management Budget, uh, that's folks that are really taking a hard look at uh, government fleets and making determination of why they're so large, why do we need them all. Uh, OPM, or Office of Personnel Management, what a lot of folks don't realize, it's the Office of Personnel Management that regulates the drivers or the motor vehicle operators. It's not GSA. And so anytime you're wondering, well, how often should they have physicals? Uh, what type of drug test should be done? The first thing the fleet manager needs to do is contact the HR or human resources shop and have them check these regulations or you can do the research. Uh, place to go would be in the Code of Federal Regulations Part 930. 
Uh, the next one, of course, plug-in electric hybrids, uh, preventative maintenance, uh, personally owned vehicle, radio frequency identification. Uh, this has been used in the logistics world for many years. And uh, for the last several years, it's also been used in the fleet arena. And oftentimes what it is, uh, you've got a transmitter on the asset and whenever they go through a portal, information is picked up, it shows where they are and what they've been doing. Uh, standard form SF, uh, standard operating procedures, that's pretty common. And then I mentioned a little bit earlier about strategic sustainability performance plan, and that is uh, submitted uh, by the chief, uh, oh goodness. Anyway, it's submitted in June of each year, uh, and your fleet management plan is part of it. Uh, then sport utility vehicle, United States code, and for United States code, doesn't matter where you're working, state, local, government, corporate, uh, you all fall under United States codes. Uh, vehicle to grid, uh, that means that it can take energy from the car's battery pack and feed it uh, through a unit to power a house or send it back into the electric grid. Uh, vehicle allocation methodology, we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, vehicle equivalent unit. Uh, that is something that a lot of folks are not familiar with unless you've had the certification trainings. And this was originally developed by the Air Force back in the 70s. And what that is, it's a method of measurement so you can make a determination of what type of staffing you may need to man a garage or a fleet uh, management organization. Dependent upon the types of vehicles, the quantities of vehicles, age of the vehicles and the operational parameters. Uh, vehicle identification number, that is really the birth certificate of each vehicle. It is only used one time, and after that it's disposed of. Uh, vehicle level data, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Same thing as uh, asset level data. Uh, vehicle miles traveled, uh, another metric that you need to measure. And of course, then a zero emission vehicle, which means there's no uh, exhaust from the onboard source of power. AFDC, or Alternative Fuels Data Center, if you haven't accessed this, this is a very important site to go to. It's a Department of Energy program that is, <clears throat> is an informative source for alternative fuels and advanced vehicles. The Alternative Fuels Data Center provides information, data, and tools to help the fleet manager and other transportation decision makers to find ways to reach their energy and economic goals through the use of alternative and renewable fuels. When you access our website, you can get help finding alternative fueling stations to include electric charging stations, also electricity, natural gas, and other fuel prices, and federal and state laws and incentives for alternative fuels and vehicles air quality, fuel efficiency, and other transportation-related topics. If you have not been to this website, I highly encourage you to do so. All you have to do is go into your web browser and uh, type in DOE space AFDC, and it will take you straight to it. Uh, of course, API, American Petroleum Institute. Uh, then you have the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And folks said, well, why is that important? It's important because in the state, local government, et cetera, it provides tax incentives to invest in energy efficient products, uh, both in building and in vehicles. Uh, BTS or Bureau of Transportation Statistics, that's part of the DOT or De uh, Department of Transportation. And what they do is they compile and analyze and make accessible information on the nation's transportation system. And just as an example, uh, one of the things they track is the retail sales of vehicles to determine future infrastructure needs. Uh, trends in sales for particular types of vehicles may also have implications for safety, energy uses, air pollution, depreciation, and other matters. And so there's a ton of information that can be found there. For those who are in the California area, of course, California Air Resources Board or CARB, uh, one thing you don't wanna do is violate that. There can be an extensive fine associated to it. And that's not just for state, local governments, the federal space, you can be fined as well. Uh, about three years ago, I was involved in a study at an installation level out in California. And I will tell you, there's many things we uncovered had the carbon inspectors come in 
they would have been paying a lot of money. Uh, California Energy Commission, of course, and then you got DOE, U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, then you have uh, EERE, or Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EIA, Energy Information Administration, EPA, I think that's pretty explanatory, is GM, and then the NMHC, or non-methanol or methane hydrocarbon, and of course, NOx or nitrogen oxides. All right, now we'll get into a few essential fleet terms. Uh, of course, auction, I think that's pretty clear. For most people in the federal space, they're using GSA for their auction. Uh, out on the corporate side, they usually have a contractor or somebody they send it off to. Uh, benchmarking, I think that's pretty clear. That's where you take a look at your organization, find another organization very similar to yours, and uh, see how they're operating, and then compare yourself to them. Uh, Biofuels, again, uh, that's uh, B20, et cetera. Uh, capital cost, net capital cost. This is one that a lot of folks seem to get a little confused on. But capital cost uh, basically it includes all the costs of the vehicle, such as you know the price of the vehicle, licensing, taxes, interest, et cetera. And net capital cost refers to the price of the vehicle subtracting any of the manufacturer discounts and customer down payments from the manufacturer's suggested retail uh, price. Uh, Cost per mile, I think that's pretty explanatory. Uh, depreciation, this is one thing within the federal space we do not do well. We don't capture our depreciation as accurately as what we should be doing. Uh, and what that is, <clears throat> you typically take the vehicle, the price of the vehicle with any additions you've done on it, uh, and you amortize it over the life cycle or how long you plan on keeping it in the fleet. And for each year, you depreciate it that, uh, that amount. Uh, fixed cost uh, within a fleet, of course, uh, example would be insurance and depreciation. Uh, next one here, fleet creep. Uh, also, uh, no one is over fleeting. And that's another uh, term that's coming up here in a second. But typically what we do is as we have a fleet and um, we get replacement vehicles in, we say to ourselves, oh, you know, that the sedan out there, it's probably got another three or four months on it. Or it's got three or four years left on it. I think I'm going to hang on to it. And that is fleet creep. What those vehicles are doing, even though they're paid for, they're still costing you money to be there. And so that's uh, something that fleet managers have to have a very strong discipline on is as they have replacement vehicles, they need to take the vehicles that have been replaced and take them out of service and send them off the auction. Uh, home to work, uh, we talked about that briefly a minute ago. There's a lot of folks who are struggling with that, how they get a good policy on it. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times when people have home to work, when they first start, they're only living 10 or 15 miles from the office. Uh, but when they find out they're commuting for free, they go out for a larger, nicer home at less cost, 50 miles out. And that's something that the government and many other folks uh, across the nation are struggling with. Those hybrid, hybrid vehicles, uh, indirect costs. Uh, of course, that's a cost that can be associated directly, that cannot be associated directly to any particular vehicle. And an example of an indirect cost was uh, is, is in a garage where you've got both oil and no means of measurement. So you may not know how much of that's being distributed to one particular vehicle. And so that oil would become an indirect cost. Uh, life, <clears throat> excuse me, life cycle costs or total fixed and operating costs of the vehicle over the entire period that it is held in the fleet. Of course, motor pool self-explanatory over fleeting, as I mentioned, that is the same thing as fleet creep. Uh, personal use of the vehicle, I think that's self-explanatory. Uh, replacement cycle, uh, this is another one, and it really ties right back into life cycle costs. Uh, what you have to do, you have to calculate the total life cycle cost uh, of ownership to make the determination and when it's best to renew uh, or purchase a new vehicle. You know, need to know when that vehicle has its greatest residual value. And for those of you who have been through the fleet certification training, uh, we really beat that one up quite a bit. Uh, one of them is a smiley uh, face graph that we show where it shows when uh, the the price of vehicle drops down and when they, the cost of operation starts going up and that includes uh, what the uh, residual value would be and so it tells you when you should be turning it and renewing that vehicle 
And that's something that a lot of folks are struggling with as well. Uh, variable cost, that's pretty explanatory. Uh, vehicle availability and downtime, of course, that's uh, how many vehicles you have available when, how many are in the down uh, line uh, waiting to be repaired. Uh, vehicle utilization, that's something that has to be tracked as a metric. Uh, you want to know how often your vehicle's out, how long they're out, and what they're being used for. Uh, work orders, of course, if you have shops, you understand that. Uh, yellow fleet. This is one thing within the federal space. Uh, if you're with the Marine Corps, if you're within the Navy or the Air Force, some of the DOD elements, they do a great job of managing their federal fleet because a fleet manager that does motor vehicle fleet also manages those. Uh, unfortunately, when you get into a lot of civilian departments and agencies, the fleet manager runs the motor vehicle fleet and somebody else does the yellow fleet. And the yellow fleet's comprised of your road graders, your backhoes, your cranes, forklifts, things like that. And that is uh, something that needs to be focused upon. And of course, 701 waivers, uh, that's something we're going to discuss in a minute. And then there are many others as well. If you're involved in the fleet arena, as you move forward, you will see. Okay, some important regulations. We're going to talk about EPAC here in a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, of course, that established a number of energy management goals for federal facilities and fleets. And you see there, it, it's EPAC includes facilities and its energy content or burns within those facilities. Uh, you have ESA 2007 or the Energy Independence and Security Act uh, that focused on energy reduction goals for federal buildings, uh, Office of Management and Budget uh, reporting requirements, reducing petroleum and increasing alternative fuel use. So fleet didn't get off with the ESA 2007 Act. Uh, it set more challenging goals in EPAC 2005, and it also superseded those two executive orders. Uh, one thing that we have to, within the federal space, be very aware of is Executive Order 13513 bans texting while driving in government vehicles or with government-provided cell phones. And so what that's telling you, you can be operating your personal vehicle, and if you're using a government-provided cell phone, you darn well not, better not be texting because if something should happen, they can uh, take action against you. Uh, the latest big executive order was 13693, March of 2015, planning for federal sustainability in the next decade. And those in the federal space are very well of this. One of the new requirements where it makes sense, total costs of cycle sense is telematics. The requirement for telematics and light duty and medium duty vehicles. Okay, um, Energy Policy Act 2005, of course, that's a statutory law, and it's updated and expanded to EPAC in 1992. And for those of you who are out in the, in the uh, state, local government, corporate world, EPAC also applies to you. Uh, Section 701 requires dual fuel AFEs to use alternative fuel 100% of the time unless DOE grants a waiver due to unavailability or if the fueling station is within a five mile or 15 minute drive, or it's an unreasonable expense. I will tell you what you consider five miles and 15 minutes, DOE may not. They typically look at the installation where the vehicle is garaged at, where the fuel is available, and as a crow flies, what it looks like. And what I will tell you is when you submit for your 701 waivers, you're not gonna have them all approved because that's just the way it is. Uh, DOE has different opinions of, of what you should be doing. But in all fairness to DOE, many times we have drivers who drive right by the alternative fuel station and go to the installation and then they say, well, I'm over five miles or 15 minutes away. And so what we would encourage folks to do, fleet managers, make sure all your drivers are well aware of where these uh, fueling stations are and highly encourage them to use them. Uh, the 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act, those regulations, of course, retain the greenhouse gas and petroleum consumption reductions. It applies to vehicles manufactured for sale in the U.S., even if they're shipped overseas for operation. Uh, vehicle acquisition, agency fleet planning, and infrastructure development. And when they're talking about infrastructure development, they're not talking about building garages. 
what they're talking about is alternative fuel fueling infrastructure and getting a plan in place, uh, seeking budget uh, approvals to do so. Uh, examples of uh, Section 141 uh, prohibits federal agencies from requiring light duty vehicles and medium duty passenger vehicles that are not low greenhouse gas emitting vehicles. Now, something else we've got to point out here, low greenhouse gas emitting vehicles, if you have vehicles and there is no alternative fuel available, those will count as an alternative fuel vehicle, but there cannot be any alternative fuel within a certain range of five miles, 15 minutes away from that site. These are usually uh, used for more remote sites. Uh, Section 142 requires agencies to develop executable plans to meet statutory and executive order fuel consumption requirements and report annually to DOE on the progress towards the goals laid out in the plan. Okay, uh, some important fleet management bulletins, and these, of course, apply mainly to the federal space. Uh, whether you're a federal contractor or not, you still have to uh, abide by these if you're operating uh, government vehicles. Uh, main one here, what I want to point out is uh, FMR Bolt and B33, Alternative Fuel Vehicle Guidance for Law Enforcement and Emergency Vehicles. Remember back on the acronyms, I talked about the LE1s, 2s, and 3s. Well, what the difference is, is LE1 is configured for apprehensions, arrest, dignitary, protection, and pursuit. Then LE2 is configured for to perform intelligence, investigation, security, and undercover. And where an LE3 is really more of an administrative uh, type support vehicle. And the reason for these designations is to determine uh, if an alternative fuel vehicle may be available, and if not, the administrator or the secretary of the department of the agency may request an alternative fuel vehicle exemption. And so that is what's really in part of the B33. Uh, another highlight here, uh, of course, is the FMR Bolton B43. This is the latest, latest one that was issued by the Office of Government-Wide Policy, which is a GSA organization. And that's uh, the new uh, lay layout for the vehicle allocation methodology for agency fleets. Uh, one of the things it says in there is you now perform a VAM, uh, our vehicle allocation methodology, every five years, but that's uh, unless the mission changes. And so what I would offer to most uh, departments and agencies, your mission is constantly changing. Does that mean you do an entire VAM for your entire fleet? No. What you do is you take a look at those areas within the organization that have changed and uh, perform a smaller, more distinct, focused uh, VAM upon them. But other than that, every five years, you should do a VAM over the entire fleet. What a lot of folks don't realize is a lot of what we do within the fleet is not because we want to do it. It's because we have to do it. It's statutory or administrative law and they provide the basis or foundation for federal fleet management. Uh, statutory law, of course, the United States Code, which contains the laws passed and amended by Congress. Administrative law are your federal, departmental, and agency regulations which implement or apply the statutory law. And one thing that you will notice is when they're writing administrative laws, what they can never do is weaken or diminish the United States Code. What they might do is they may further enforce or they may strengthen it, but they will never be able to weaken it. Either way, uh, this is something you have to pay attention to. You have to know which ones are applicable to your organization, to your fleet, and you need to be able to communicate that to management so they know why it is what you're doing. And of course, statutory law and administrative law are both legally binding. All right, so of course, federal fleet management, the basis in law, this is uh, the number two of uh, the slides here. And the Federal Property Administrative Service Act of 1949, uh, that affects property management. Well, of course, water and motor vehicles are property, uh, the personal property realm, they're not real, but personal. Uh, covers procurement, utilization, disposal, records management of personal property as established, the General Services Administration, 
And of course, Public Law 766 amended the act to authorize GSA to operate uh, vehicle motor pools. And folks, this is where you get GSA fleet lease. GSA fleet lease is considered a motor pool. Uh, and that was public law was, uh, was put out in 1958. Uh, Section 204C of the Act gave the administrator of GSA authority to issue regulations. And so a lot of the FMRs and things like that you see, this is where they get the authority to issue those. And uh, of course, FMRs, what they do is they provide minimum guidance. Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR. There's actually 50 titles in there, uh, but the one that you need to be aware of within the Federal Fleet Arena is Title 41, Public Contracts and Property Management. There's very subchapters and parts uh, that are relevant to fleet management, and just an example, uh, Sections 102-5, that's a home to work transportation, 102-34, Motor Vehicle Management. What this is going to do is not going to tell you how to do your job. What it's going to do is tell you what your minimum requirements are. And so never take that and say, this is all I have to do as a fleet manager. You have to be on top of your game. You have to know how to better manage the taxpayer dollars. And that means management of your fleet. And uh, listed right here is a shortcut to these federal fleet management regulations. And uh, you should be able to get a copy of this briefing afterwards. Uh, and that's the link for it. And what I would say is your required reading should be 411234 motor vehicle management. So spend a little bit of time, go through that, uh, highlight those areas that are of interest to you. But remember, these are minimum requirements, not maximums. Okay, 102.34.50, that's just an example here. What size motor vehicles may you obtain? Except for exempted vehicles, could be law enforcement, uh, executive, you know, multiples, things like that. Agencies shall acquire vehicles that achieve maximum fuel efficiency. I think that's pretty simple. Meet minimum body size and engine size specifications. Folks, that can be a tough one because everybody wants the largest thing that's available out on the market. Uh, possess the minimum operational equipment needed. And everybody says, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is you shouldn't be getting a vehicle with a leather interior. If you're operating in the deserts of the Southwest, you may not want a vehicle with heated mirrors. And so there's certain things you need to know of and know the operation geographical areas of your assets, your vehicles, before you make this determination. Uh, there are mid-size and class three or smaller sedans, except when larger class four sedans, <clears throat> excuse me, are essential to the agency's mission. And how do you determine what size vehicles obtain for your mission? You know, one of the biggest things we as fleet managers do is when we're doing fleet replacements, we replace our vehicles automatically with those vehicles that are already in the fleet. That's an easy thing to do. You know, the Ford 150 or 250 has always been used by Bobby. And so therefore, we'll do the same thing again this year, but what we need to do is we need to take a look at the asset. We need to develop util utilization criteria. Uh, we need to look at the criticality, the geographical operational area. We need to develop that utilization criteria and determine what the minimum re uh, criteria is for replacement or if the vehicle should even be replaced. Oftentimes we replace vehicles because they've always had one and then come to find out when we do a real hard drill down they could have been sharing a vehicle with somebody else in the office. We didn't need to, one would have been sufficient. And so it's extremely important you do that. You conduct a VAM study for each vehicle uh, in the fleet at least every five years unless the mission changes. Of course, we talked about that in the VAM bulletin. Identify mission critical vehicles. Which vehicles do we have that if they went away, we would not be able to perform our mission? Not every vehicle is required. Determine the optimal fleet profile. What should the inventory look like? What should the mix should be? How many sedans should I have? How many trucks? Uh, if you're into uh, uh, heavier equipment, how many uh, tractor trailers do I need? Things like this. Uh, and then you acquire or dispose of vehicles to achieve that optimal fleet profile. And I mentioned that a few minutes ago. That is when you take a look at your entire population of your vehicles 
and what is it that I need in order to meet my mission that would be considered my optimal fleet. Another example here, 102.34.340. You have to have an FMIS, okay, or Fleet Management Information System. What it does identifies and collects accurate inventory, cost data, et cetera, things like that. Uh, provides the information necessary to satisfy both internal and external reporting requirements. Uh, folks, what you have here, you have a CFR 340, you have a federal management uh, bulletin, FMRB 15, that gives minimum requirements what it should have. But what really changed uh, this scenario is a new requirement for fast vehicle level data, uh, also known as asset level data. Uh, and again, I mentioned this earlier, beginning in 2017 reporting cycle, federal agencies are required to report this information about their motor vehicle fleet. Uh, this is a real tough one. There's about 70 different elements, and this is not something that is rolled up as, as all the sedans into one bucket. This is based upon individual vehicles. And so if you don't have an FMIS, you're not going to be able to do this. And so what you need to do is figure out how you're going to do it. Uh, of course, here's the website down below here that will take you directly to the Idaho National Labs or fastwebinl.gov for your vehicle level data. And uh, just like federal management regulation bulletins, the FMRs and CFRs, uh, they provide minimum requirements for what your FMIS must capture. Uh, data requirements have significantly increased, as I just mentioned, with the BLD or the ALD. Okay, now uh, what we're going to have, and I'm going to turn this over to Gary Hatfield, uh, our partner, uh, additional fleet educational opportunities within the MPMA. Now, Gary? Uh, okay, thank you, Willie. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's look at the next slide. And um, we would uh, encourage everyone to take advantage of NPMA's training and certification program because it really does give you a comprehensive uh, education in the business of fleet management. On the slide, you can see that uh, we have some of the benefits explained here on how the training and certification can help you. Um, recognition and uh, Further, furthermore, you can uh, begin to network with other people that are doing the same type of work in fleet management that, that you do, and you can often uh, gain a lot of insights and information uh, from your peers. The training and certification courses are available through NPMA, and they're all listed on the website. Uh, and in fact, I was just going through those this morning and putting them on my calendar for the coming year. And there's uh, quite a number of them uh, spread out all over the country, Washington, D.C., San Diego, uh, even Hawaii, Norfolk, Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of training opportunities. You go and attend classes for three, for three days and you uh, take a test at the end of each day. Um, and once you successfully pass all of the tests, you can achieve this certification. And once again, in the table here on the slide, you can see what the three levels of certification are. And Willie had uh, uh, kind of addressed these earlier in the presentation. So you start out at the certified federal fleet specialist level. You don't have to have any experience. Uh, there aren't uh, any um, other certifications required to get into the program. Uh, that is kind of the basic level of training and certification. Then you go to the next level, which is the Certified Federal Fleet Administrator. You do need one year uh, minimum experience documented, and you can uh, fill out a form and explain what your experience is. And you also, of course, have to have the basic level, the specialist level, in order to move to the second level, Administrator. And then finally, uh, if you want to go all the way and achieve the top level of certification, you, be, you can become a certified federal fleet manager. Uh, requires three years of, of documented experience and um, prior attainment of the uh, other two levels of certification. More information, hey, Jerry, you can you see like the website about? there. Yes. I was going to say, would you yes. like to talk about the SIG? 
about the uh, yeah we're going to talk about that next I think it's on the next slide okay. uh, if we advance okay um, so here uh, is uh, some more information on the opportunities and uh, especially uh, the NPMA National Education Seminar in Chicago in August uh, you can um, hopefully attend the um, the NES and there will be fleet classes prior to the NES. And I would like to point out that um, you can join the fleet special interest group, and there's a website here that's shown, and I would encourage all of you to join that. Uh, we're trying to improve that. Uh, I've been recently appointed the leader of the fleet management special interest group, and I would encourage you to uh, check that out, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just uh, recently, a couple of days ago, they posted a contest for NPMA members, and you can uh, go on the website, the Fleet SIG, the Fleet Management SIG, and you can um, see what the contest is all about and have the potential for winning prizes. I, I believe they're uh, Amazon gift cards. So that uh, could be a lot of fun for you and uh, might, uh, might bring you some reward. Uh, there are some other things that we have uh, working. Is uh, There's an annual uh, fleet management award that recognizes new or in innovative fleet management practices that improve operations to reduce costs or risks that also improve accountability and records management. Willie? was talking about vehicle level data. That's accountability and records management. And finally, uh, contribute to the overall goal of the organization. So um, we would encourage people to uh, let us know what you're doing in these areas because you may uh, find yourself uh, competing for uh, a fleet management award, which is presented at the National Education Seminar in August in Chicago. So uh, lots of good things going on. Uh, there is, um, uh, as I said, the contest. If you go to the Fleet Management SIG, you click on the forums, and you'll find more information about that there. So I believe that's the last slide, Willie. Uh, there might be one more with some no. contact information. Yeah, we got one more here. And what I want to uh, say also, from what Gary is saying, National Education Seminar is exactly that. It is not a conference. It is an educational seminar. Uh, there are a few open meetings, but other than that, uh, you go into different rooms and you learn on different topics. Uh, this is uh, usually uh, em embraced or endorsed by Office of Personnel Management uh, every year. And oh, by the way, when you register for it, it also covers your dues, I would say, for the MPMA or National Property Management Association. For those of you who have not taken certification training, there's usually uh, one, two, or possibly three levels of certification that is offered three days prior to the National Education Seminar being held. So it'd be held, uh, that training would be held on the uh, 3rd, 4th, and 5th of August, and then the Educational Seminar starts on the 6th through the 9th. And highly encourage you, if you haven't done it, uh, go there. Uh, great information passed. Uh, you have a lot of fleet experts that are speaking at the different sessions. Okay, uh, this concludes our session for the day. And of course, I'm William Gook, an Associate Vice President of Federal Fleet Consulting for Mercury Associates. And if you have any questions, please call or email me, and I would be glad to, uh, to answer them. And again, as Gary said, I highly encourage you to join the NPMA SIG for fleet. It's an opportunity for fleet uh, professionals to get together and discuss different topics or ask questions, something maybe you don't understand. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for attending.